this week I'm continuing our series on relationships in the kingdom of God. And this is part two of the message I started last week, which was, um, the way I've titled it is those uncomfortable verses in the Bible about relationships. Okay, and, I, and since we talked about marriage uh, several weeks ago, I wanted to talk about one of these uncomfortable verses about marriage that's in the Bible, and it comes from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and let me just read it out. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the, to the Lord. And I talked last week about that, so if you weren't here, you'll have to listen to the message on Facebook. Then it continues, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So as I mentioned last week, this week I wanted to focus on verse 23 that says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. And as I introduced last week, what we're going to talk about today is what does it mean for the husband to be the head of the wife? You know, I remember many, many times I've been in conversations with people Christians, and they've they've made statements like this. Well, the husband's the head of the home. Or the man's the head of the home. And here's my response. I haven't said anything. Why? Because here's what's going through my mind. Well, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? Because people say it in a way like it's, we know automatically what that means. You know, I know what they're sort of getting at, but when I read the Bible, I've never seen in the Bible its state. The husband, or say, the, 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 uh, what, 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 it's say what they're implying. The man rules the house. That's what they're saying most of the time. And here's here's what my view is. I don't know. Because I don't I don't know what exactly you mean by that. So today's message is is try to unpack that. What does it mean? What does this mean? Well It all revolves around this word word, head. What does head mean in this context? Let me just give you a few definitions. You know, 80% of the use of the word head, the Greek word uh, head, which is kephal, you know, you can pronounce it any way because it's ancient Greek. So uh, I'm just pronouncing it kephal. The, when, that, then, when that Greek word is used in the New Testament, 80% of the time, it's, it's talking about a physical head. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know, that thing between your shoulders, the upper part of the body containing the face and the brains. So that's the majority of use of the hair, of head in the Bible, in the New Testament. The other 20%, it's used as a metaphor okay, it's used as a, as a picture to represent or describe something else, okay? So most of the time, nearly all the time, in fact, in the New Testament, when it's, when, uh, and it's Paul that uses it, it's talking about the relationship between the head and the body, i.e. the head is Jesus Christ and the body is the church, okay? But in he, this place... Head is used to describe, as a metaphor, for the relationship between the husband and the wife. Okay? So, look, when we look at this text, it's clear 
that somehow there's a parallel between Christ and the church and a husband and his wife. What I'm going to describe is two views, two, the two main views at the moment uh, on what the meaning head is that Paul's referring to here, okay? And there's two main views in church. So it's views on the metaphor, okay? The metaphor use. So the first view is that head represents leadership. The head is the leader. The head is the authority over. The head is the chief, the ruler. All these types of words, okay? The other view is that head means source or origin. So let's, let's have a look at those in context. So let's take the first one, the first view. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the leader of the wife, as Christ is the leader of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Okay? Here's the alternative. Wives submit to your husbands as your own, uh, wives submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the source of the wife, as Christ is the source of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Uh, as, as, yeah. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also uh, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Just to let you know, I haven't got my reading glasses and it's got tiny text here that I'm reading. I've got to get new glasses. Um, so, let me bring up now that other text in 1 Corinthians and... Let me, let me say this, this is, this is, although it's talking about a different subject, it's not talking about the, the husband and wife relationship. Paul used similar language and he's talking about men and women. So it's not a direct, he's not talking about the same subject, but there are connections. Let me read this out. But I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man. Note there that he says every man, the head of every man, but he doesn't say the head of every woman. Note that. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And then I'm skipped down. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For the man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So these passages, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and Genesis, referencing Genesis chapter 2, what, how do the two different views interpret that? Well, verse one, a, a view one um, that, that uh, key foul is interpreted as authority or, or ruler Paul is basically saying that God has established an order of spiritual leadership and authority from creation of a husband over his wife. So that authority relationship that man has over his wife, God put that in creation. Okay, that's what they say Paul's saying. The other view is this, that, that, uh, that head means source. Paul is saying that Eve came from Adam. Literally. Therefore, Adam is the source or origin of Eve's life. You could also say that, couldn't you? He took a rib out of Adam and he made Eve. Whether you believe that's literal or not, theologically, let's look at the support for the views outside of the Bible, okay, of what Kephal. Uh, head means in ancient Greek. So when Paul's writing to the Ephesians, what do they understand? Well, 
view one would say that the standard meaning in, in or the dictionaries of ancient Greek is that head means leader, authority over, chief, ruler. They'd also say that, that, uh, that most examples in ancient Greek literature between 200 BC and 100 AD, i.e. the time of writing of the New Testament, that that is also the meaning. Okay, now, what's view to believe? Well, they say the normal sense of the meaning of kephal, head, in the Greek, Greek in the first century, is source or origin. And the majority of that examples in ancient Greek literature has a sense of source as the meaning. So, they both make the same claims. Isn't that annoying? Here's some of the interpretations. Okay, looking at the biblical evidence, which I've only shared a part, the bit that I could share, and looking at the cultural evidence. Um in the ancient Near East in, in the first century. View one, we interpret that as that man and women are equal in value before God, but God has established a hierarchical pattern of family life, a divine order from creation, Genesis 2. Okay? Um, therefore, the husband has, uh, has God given authority and leadership over his wife and family. So now, look, I'm purely summarising. There's a, there's a lot more detail in, in these views and differences within. View two would interpret it as man and women are equal in value before God. So they both agree on that. There's no issue about equality, innate equality uh, or value. As... Christ is the source of life for the church, so also man is the source of life for woman, or, or husband is the source of life for wife, also based in Genesis 2. Okay? However, husband and wife co-share responsibilities in life and family, and any inherent differences between the two are due to gifting, not gender. So for the view that that head means leader, authority over, chief, ruler, it may, it's, it's, it's generally, now I'm making generalisations, but it's generally, I say it because it's generally true. Uh, in that view, clearly de- defined roles based on gender. So the husband's role is this and the wife's role is that. Uh, i.e., husband is the head of the home. I hear is the ruling authority over the home. Now, again, like how people work that out, that it'll differ. But that, that's what the general meaning is. Oftentimes, it's that the husband has the final say, the practical implication. Uh, another implication, application, is women are excluded from roles that give them spiritual authority over a man. So that's more the application within church life, for instance. What about view two? Head means source or origin. Well, the responsibilities for leadership within the marriage are shared or defined by gifting, not gender. Now let's look at the problems. Because there's problems with both. And I'm, and I'm trying to be fair with both. Okay? Let's look at view one, that head means leader, authority over, chief, ruler. And remember, it's what, you know, people have different views of what all those could mean. But let's make some uh, points. Jesus redefines authority. 
Mark chapter 10, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So Jesus got his disciples here. He's saying, look at the, the, the world, the ungodly, the Gentiles. They don't, they're, you know, they're not following God. That's how, what authority looks like in their world. He's pointing at them and saying, not in the kingdom of God. That's not how authority works in the kingdom of God. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus redefines what authority is in the kingdom of God. Let's look at the next one. Galatians 3.28 seems to rule out gender distinctions for those in Christ. Galatians 3.28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Bible includes examples of women in positions of leadership of God's people. Deborah in Judges, she was a judge. Uh, you got Miriam, who was, who, uh, was Moses and Aaron, Aaron's sister. She was also a leader. You've also got Lydia, you know, Acts chapter 16. She, it's, she led her whole household. And you've got Junia, who in, in Romans chapter 16... People argue about this, but it's pretty clear that, that Paul refers to her as an apostle. Lastly, Paul uses a metaphor of head rather than, clearly an, rather than making a clear emphatic statement about the role of husband and wife. So he could have said clearly, but remember, he's using a metaphor. Metaphors are much harder to interpret than just a clear, emphatic statement. Okay. Now, let's look at verse uh, view two. The claim that the widely accepted meaning of kifal during the first century is source has been mostly discredited. In his 1985 article, does head mean source or authority over in Greek literature, Wayne Grugen surveyed 2,336 random pieces of ancient Greek literature from 36, or 36 different authors from the database of the University of California and did not find a single example indicating that head has the meaning of source. An orthodox view of the Trinity would not describe God as a source of Christ. But I want you to realise that the source of every man is Christ and the source of the woman is man and the source of Christ is God. But here's the problem with that statement, if it's source, is that source infers made or created. For instance, there's no problem accepting that that the source of woman is man, because God said in Genesis 2, he made, he created woman out of man. Whether you believe it's literal or not, okay, that's fine. But you can't say that Jesus was created by God the Father. That, that, that's not orthodox Trinitarian belief, okay, Begotten of the Father means the substance of. It means the Son is of the same. It's, he's, he's also God. He's not a created being. So that's problematic that you would have that interpretation with source. And finally, substituting source for head with other references in the New Testament doesn't fit. Let me, let me um, 
give you more detail about that. So head is used five times, this word kephal, head is used five times in the New Testament in Ephesians and Colossians. Taking, excluding this one we're talking about in Ephesians 5, if you look at the context of what Paul is talking about, three times there's a definite context of authority. There's two other uh, examples, other uses, and you could actually use source in those other two. It's possible. Okay? So that's problematic. If you want to consistently say that head means source, it's hard to prove that. So, which do we choose? Let me give you a third alternative. Now, let me be clear. This is my view. Okay? And I don't fall into either of view one or view two. It's a hybrid. So, my view is that... It's not my view alone, by the way. And, you know, there's all sorts of views. Uh, nuance probably from both of the view one and view two. Head means responsibility for plus the authority to carry out the responsibility. So wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is responsible for the wife as Christ is responsible for the church. So there's three main points I want to make why I think this is a better view to have. Now, and here's the thing, I, I know people with all three views and I understand why and that's okay. But here's my view. Number one, it fits and makes sense of the emphasis in the passage in Ephesians that we read last week of the husband to love his wife. Think about that, the responsibility. W what is the responsibility of being the head, the husband, the head of the wife? Well, Paul talks at length, as we read out last week. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Number the two reason it allows for the redefining of authority, the Jesus model, the Jesus model of authority, servant-orientated authority. So, the first will be last. You humble, humble yourself. Become a servant. If it, who, who wants to be first needs to become the servant of all. Not controlling. Authority is not controlling or manipulative. Authority is voluntary, voluntarily given. So authority is voluntarily given, not forcibly taken. And it has an other-orientated purpose of leading, guiding, caring, etc. I, it's not me-focused. I'm the head of the house. You just got to do what I say. Well, where's that coming from? There sounds like a self-centeredness emphasis there. Just serve me. Just do what I want you to do. Number three, the Bible displays a pattern of authority with purpose. So if you look at the New Testament teaching, there's a pattern going on. With responsibility comes with it the, the authority to fulfill the responsibility, i.e. a spiritual ability to achieve a purpose. So, so what I'm saying is I do actually think head has the sense of authority. 
I do believe that. But the authority is there to fulfill a purpose that God has given. Okay? Let's have a look here in Ephesians chapter 6, just further down the passage. And all the parents will love this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. I'm going to be talking about this after Easter. Uh, so if you want to invite your children along, it'll be good for them to hear it. But then, see what it says? So that it may go well with you. Purpose. Why do children have to obey their parents? Well, just because I said so. No. There's a purpose. So things would go well with them that they may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in what? Training and instruction of the Lord. Purpose. Why should children obey? And interestingly, that is a command for children because they're, they're, they're still learning. They're not adults yet. They don't know what they're doing. So they do need to obey, but the purpose is, is so life would go well with them. Here's another one. This is in a church context, Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Why? Why would you do that? Because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, so that that would be of no benefit to you. So here it's saying, what's the, what's the authority for? Well, the authority is because God has given them an ability to see, a spiritual ability to see over the congregation. It's a, you could say it's a gift. He's given them a responsibility and he's given them the authority to fulfill that responsibility. Just like he gave responsibility to parent, parents. So the authority is not there to lord it over people. The authority is there to help people. This view maintains the majority support from in and outside the Bible for maintaining the sense of authority over for that Greek word kephal, kephal. So I think there's, you can't really argue it means something else. I think that has been debunked. But it's a redefining of what authority means. It recognises the, necess the necessary element of authority which is essential for living in the kingdom of God before Jesus returns. What I mean by that is that we live in a fallen world. There, we have a spiritual opposition. If we are going to have some ability to resist that spiritual, spiritual opposition, we need authority to do so. God has not left us helpless. He's given us authority to pray over our families. He's given us authority. I mean, he says, I've given you authority to uh, trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So authority is something, a part of the kingdom of God now. Let me give you an example. Uh, a couple of months ago, I'd been, been pondering on this whole area of spiritual authority and you know, as I said, you know, I've never had a real conviction ab about this whole area. I mean, I, I, you know, had leanings in certain ways, but I had a, didn't have a real solid conviction. And, and I started to reflect on spiritual authority. And I had a real conviction to pray for my family. And, and I started, rather than to pray for them, I started to exert my authority in prayer. So I started making declarations over them. Declarations over my wife, declarations over my son, declarations over my daughter. And they were all about um, resisting the enemy's devices in trying to cause them harm in some way. 
Interestingly enough, uh, uh, I didn't tell Susie about it. And later on, I don't know if it was that day or the day after, certainly within a couple of days, she said, you know, I felt something different uh, today or yesterday. Were you praying for me? And I said, Yo, yeah, I was. And, you know, I noticed a noticeable difference with my children. I wasn't, I wasn't saying, God, please do this, God, please do that. No, I was exerting my authority over them, commanding, using the authority that God had given me. Wasn't trying to manipulate them. No, I was, you know, I was blessing them. I was commanding blessings over them. Um, you know, I was, tar- I won't go into all the details, but I was targeting different things I felt like they were being oppressed by. And there was a noticeable difference. There was a noticeable difference. And I've continued to do that. And, you know, look, experientially, you know, because not only do I live by my theological conviction, I also live from my experience as well. We all do. My experience is taking authority over my family makes a difference. But it's not there to manipulate them and try to make Susie do what I want her to do or my children. That's not the, the, um, that's not the, the, the way that Jesus articulates authority in the New Testament. So, this view also takes seriously the redefining of authority by Jesus away from the hierarchical patriarchal nature to a servant orientated nature of authority. Now I could say to be fair, view view you could you could have that perspective with holding on to view one. Okay? Uh, and that's certainly a very positive aspect that can be incorporated in both. I think view two, that that head means source, it actually seems to take out this element of authority. And in some ways, I think it disempowers us to take authority in a fallen world. And uh, lastly, it makes sense for the responsibilities within marriage... Oh, sorry, it makes space for the responsibilities within marriage to function through gifting rather than predetermined gender roles. So this is where I would vary from view one. So I do tend to think that husband and wife... Now, this is my own view. It's fine if you have a different view. I tend to think in terms of the detail of leading a family, you know, there's things that one of you is going to be better at than the other. And just to flow with that gifting. So here's, here's an example. Susie is better at managing money than I am. You know, the ironic thing is, is I was an accountant. But naturally, look, I'll just spend more money. She doesn't. She manages it better. So she does all that. I let her do that. She just does a much better job. You know, when when we talk about decisions with money, you know, my view is we've got to sort of come to an agreement. So in terms of leading, I think it's hard to just put everything in one box. There's leadership in there's different areas of life. Now, there's things that I'm better at and I take the lead on. Okay, and that she just flows with that. But there is, I believe, the spiritual authority that God gives husbands as he does parents, as he does pastors, leaders of churches. God gives an authority, spiritual authority to use for the benefit of the context. And we need to use that authority to see God's will done. So, there we have it. Things to ponder and consider.